So I've uh, got a bit of a predicament, or I'm in a bit of a predicament. You see, I've come out to do some photography, and I've, I'm, I'm pretty much out in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, and I've realised I've forgotten my tripod, I didn't bring any water, I didn't bring any food, I don't have a compass, so I don't even know which way sunset's going to be, and it looks like it's starting to rain. I don't have any waterproofs, and I don't have a shelter, so really, I have no idea what I'm going to do. You look like you need some help, sir. Oh, yes, how are you doing, Mike? I'm good, how are you? Nice to see Fancy you. Fancy seeing you in the middle of nowhere. I know, what are the, ch what are the chances? What are the chances of this? This is Mike from, and um, um, do your thing. From uh, T T A. TA Outdoors. If you're into bushcraft, survival, and the great outdoors, you definitely need to check out Mike's channel. Uh, yeah, I was just telling them, I've basically forgotten half my gear, so maybe maybe the bush can help. We're going to have to do something, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. With this rain coming in, we'll have to do something. Right, okay, let's let's look at things we can do to help photography. Sure. Bushcraft tips to help photography, yeah? Yeah, let's do it. Right. Okay, let's do it. So we're going to show you about five or six ways you can use bushcraft to help your photography. Yeah, <laughs> this is going to be interesting and definitely needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. Okay. We've just looked around the floor at the base of this oak tree and we found lots and lots of deadwood you can see Mike here. Um, picking up lots and checking it. Now it's not going to be pretty, you know, it's not going to be like a nice Gitzo carbon fibre tripod. <laughs> but we just want to see if it's possible, yeah. using some sticks, a bit of paracord, um, if we can make a reasonably sturdy base that's also relatively manoeuvrable. I think we can do it. We both like say three? it's not going to be pretty, but I think we can do it. Okay, right, well let's, let's, make, the, let's make this tripod. So do you want to give us a rundown of what exactly the plan of action here is for this tripod? Sure, so we've got a piece of paracord here, super tough stuff. Obviously you might not have this on you, so you could just use your shoelace if you're in this situation. Yeah, of course. But thankfully we've got some paracord anyway. Uh, and we're just going to do a real simple lashing. What I'm going to do to begin with is just a, what's called a Canadian jam knot. All it is is an, a simple overhand knot to begin with, with a tag end like that. And then a second overhand knot, which you then leave fairly big, like that. But this second, this knot's acting as a, what's called a jam knot, like a stopper knot. You then, I'm gonna wrap this just around one stick to begin with. Put it through the first, the second, sorry, overhand knot, and then pull that tight. Then this is where the locking part comes in and you just ratchet it down and it all pulls tight on itself and that second knot stops it slipping. That's now super secure to that stick it's not going anywhere. So the reason I left that tag end on at the beginning here is because that's actually how you undo the knot. You just pull like that the reverse way and then you've undone your knot. So we've done the Canadian jam knot now we need to lash together our three gitzo legs to our tripod. <laughs> um, uh, if I was to do this because I'm notoriously bad at DIY I would just wrap them all together okay as it horribly <laughs> and tightly and hope that that will hold. Is there any specific techniques so, for lashing together three sticks for a tripod. Sure, that would definitely that would probably work as a temporary solution. But if you're gonna if you want your tripod to actually be a bit more sturdy, you wouldn't just wrap around the sides of the sticks. You'd also wrap parallel to them vertically, and it's called wrapping and frapping. Wrapping and frapping. And that right. just that adds to the rigidity of that wrap. It stops it coming loose. Okay, let's let's wrap and frap. <laughs> let's wrap and frap. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Mike is now wrapping around the sticks, but look how he's keeping everything nice and loose. He needs to allow space between the tripod legs in order to do a frap. Mike now passes the cord under and around his initial wrap. This would be the frap, and although it still looks loose, when he pulls the cord you can see how it all cinches and becomes nice and tight. Finally, Mike finishes the lashing off with a simple half hitch, which he does twice. Uh, right, so this is the uh, this is the finished tripod. Now, a couple of things. 
Uh, so this is dead wood we're using. We uh, didn't want to cut down any trees today. This is certainly not a survival situation. We're going to go for a soya latte after this, so <laughs> <laughs> we're not really. Um, but if, if we were using green wood, it wouldn't break, would it? It shouldn't break, no, it's much more flexible. It's got all that kind of moisture in it, so it yeah. should be a lot better. Although saying that, I would never encourage anyone to cut down green wood to make a photography tripod. Yeah. Don't, just, just remember your tripod. Um, what's this? So I've left, a, I've left an extra bit of paracord here, and that is purpose, so that I did it deliberately, so that if you wanted to hang either any gear off, you could loop it up like that, and you could either put a carabiner there or just hang some gear from there, or I know you guys sometimes like to st stabilise your tripod. We do, we love to stabilise the tripod. With a rock and you could tie a slip knot or, or a knot that would just cinch down on that rock and then you've got that weight there so that you know, you've know you just got a bit more of a sturdy tripod. Yeah, okay, so let's, let's assume that we have built this tripod and transported it to a place with a lovely view and a great composition and a nice photograph, which we don't have at the minute. Ah, we now need to... <laughs> I, I like to shoot a lot of vertical images. Okay. So. We may, we may get away with this. It's not get, getting away with it, this is engineered. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's seated there quite nicely, it's not going anywhere, but obviously we could use this extra cord if we needed to, to perhaps Stability. wrap around the, yeah, wrap around the lens once you've got your focal length set, and then just, you could tie that off. Okay, it's a bit, well luckily it's not windy today, so the yep. stability is not an issue, but we could also hang something off there to give it more stability. Oh, that's, that's, that's not that's bad solid. really. That's rotten wood really that yeah. we're using, so you can imagine with green wood how, how much stronger it would be. And we've done this in like five minutes, yeah. with, we've, all we've done is search an area of like one square meter. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not like we've looked far and wide for the perfect sticks. Yeah. I would say that this, is a success. This is a bushcraft tripod and I would use this. I'm genuinely impressed that we've made, we've made a tripod from three bits of dead wood and a bit of paracord but yeah. the thing is uh, not everybody, certainly not photographers, they don't keep paracord in their bag. It's going to get tangled with their cable releases. It's sure. going to get in the way. It's just a bit of a pain. Um, so have you got any suggestions for paracord? Let's say you have some leftover off cuts where you've just done a tripod like that. You might have some off cuts. Yep. What you can do is what's called a cobra weave. And you can lash this onto a zip on your bag which will give you an extended cord to make your zip fastenings much easier to open because sometimes they're not as easy to open. Okay. And it also allows you to store ah, this. So like a, you get a big fat zip. Exactly. Which is great in winter when you've got gloves on. Can you show us? I can show you indeed, yeah. So all you do is I've got a two foot length of paracord here. I've halved it. I make a loop. I have a little loop on my zip here. If I can get it through, pull that through. And we just, I call it a cow hitch. I pull that, those two tag ends through and basically lash it down. Now this is kind of awkward because I've got that zip there. At this point, I'm gonna work from the bottom back towards the zip. I'm gonna go for about that much length. Once you've learned, it's a fiddly process, but once you've learned how to tie the first... So is that, is that halfway or is that less than it's, halfway? It's, it's less than halfway, right. because by the time I've lashed this, you'd be surprised, all, the, all that core will compress down into a very small section. Awesome. So I'm gonna go for there, and you just wrap one over, like that, so you're creating like a bunny ear loop. Yeah. Then you get the second piece and you go over that cord and back up through that first loop. This is your first knot, so you, you, this is where you can gauge how sort of tight and, and the distance you want of your cord. So I'm gonna go for just about there. The next stage is to go over again, like that, over with the opposite side, under, and back through. Following this loop here, which is gonna be the cobra weave, I go over, over again, back under and through, pull tight. And essentially you just copy this pattern all the way down. And then you'll end up with a massive zip and spare cord. Exactly. Definitely looks like it's gonna rain. We are in the Lake District after all. So 
we're gonna build a nice shelter for the tripod and the camera so it's protected from the rain and we can continue taking photographs. Right, uh, we need to move this, right? Yeah, we'll move it right. to the side. We're uh, launching a new range of tripods, bushcraft tripods, available at all major camera retailers. Lincoln Meyer. Yeah, <laughs> merch Lincoln Meyer. <laughs> Is this just is this just a standard tarp? This is not well, it's a square tarp, it's three by three meters, but I would not say it's standard. It's more suited to proper outdoorsmen really because it's got 19 different tie-out points. So it, you can set up such a versatile shelter with this because of the, the amount of tie-out points on there. But I guess with a standard tarp, you could just add your own tie-out points to it with some rivets, and then you're basically got the same thing as this. So what we've got here is the stuff sack that I had the tarp in and a walking pole. Generally if you're up in the, in the mountains and you're hiking, doing photography, you're probably going to have a walking pole with you. This is our main central support pole for the tarp. However, you can see that's not very wide diameter there. With pressure that's going to push on the tarp and it could rip. So why not use the stuff sack that you've already got, just bunch it up and wrap it around a couple of times and that's now much more protection against the, uh, the top of the tarp. So what we've got here is the, the, the middle line. This is the middle of the shelter. I've got a tie-out point at the front, and I'm gonna to go to the second tie-out point here. That's where my pole is gonna push into. So I just find it under there. It can be a bit fiddly. I go to there. At this point, the shelter's not, it's not tight at all. So to tighten it, I just extend my, my, ridge, my uh, center pole walking stick. <laughs> Okay, so uh, even though the sun has come back out, we are in the Lake District, it's definitely going to rain at some point. So we are very, very, very happy to finally have the camera on a tripod in the shelter out of the rain. Uh, this cord here, not ideal for photography because it's going to be right in the shot, uh, but we just rigged this to show you the structure of the top. You would have this um, in place if you were sleeping, but you know, if we we're going to take a picture, um, we would just unpeg this and sling it over the back yeah. is that right yeah that's right yeah uh, right um i just i was just thinking as well um forgot my compass forgot your compass I forgot my compass now i know where we are so we're not gonna yeah. get lost but i'm thinking for photography i need to know which way uh west is for the sunset sure so how can bushcraft <laughs> show us which way is west or north or south or whatever how can we find direction so there's a number of ways uh, to do it some are better than others, some work when the sun's out, some work when you've got no sunlight at all. Much like today where it's pretty much overcast, yeah. we know roughly where the sun is, but there's been thick cloud cover coming over and sometimes that sun's gone. So I can show you one way that's actually very simple, very quick. It's not super reliable, but it's definitely applicable to us here in the UK. Yeah, and for photography, it doesn't have to be pinpoint accurate. No. We just roughly need to know which way the light's going to sure. come from if we want to photograph a particular tree or frame a mountain or something. Okay. All right, show me, show me which way's north. Let's go. Okay. So our top is uh, is there and it's pointed towards the tre these trees and that mountain. Now I'm thinking, is it'd be lovely to know that at sunset or late afternoon, the light is gonna nicely hit all of these fells and these lovely trees that we've got in the background, which is the direction the camera and the tarp is facing. But because it's cloudy, 
and I haven't got a compass and let's say for argument's sake I've never been here before and don't know anything about where we are situated. <laughs> Show me, how can we how can we determine which way is north? So one of the sort of basic, most primitive methods I guess is looking at the trees. The tree can be a good identification of where north is because moss is, uh, enjoys the shade. It likes shade, it likes damp, it likes the dark areas of woodland. You can see on this lovely oak tree here that there is moss on one side more than the other side. Now that means that the moss is going to like the shade more. Where we are in the UK is in the north face, the north facing slopes, the north facing trees. On the north side of the tree, generally there will be more moss. Okay. And you can see actually there's a big divide. You can see going all the way up the tree, you can see that moss is still growing just on one side. So to me, I would say, judging by that, from the based on the location that we are here in the north of England, I would say north is that way. That way? Yep. Was it right? It was correct. Oh, awesome. Good job. Nice one. That's good. I can't believe you got it right. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with that. That's good. So we've built a tarp. Well, we've built a shelter. We've built a tripod. We've found north. I think we need a break. I'm really thirsty. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I forgot water, but I really fancy a cup of tea. Water. Have you got tea bags? No, I haven't got tea bags. You no. haven't got tea bags? It's sacrilege, I know. No tea bags, right. no water. So we can't have a cup of tea. Oh, that's devastating. What photographer out in the wilderness with a shelter and a wooden tripod doesn't want a cup of tea while he waits for sunset? That's not good, is it? Can we, can, can the bush help us? The bush can certainly help us. We can use nature. About this. So, so good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So yeah, we, we don't have any water, but we've got a lovely stream here. It's nice and clear, but you can't be fooled. Just because a stream is clear and out in nature doesn't mean that the water's clean. There could be lots of bacteria. There could be a dead deer a couple of miles up at the top of the stream, flowing all that bacteria down, and you don't want to be drinking that. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to make a DIY water filter, uh, just using a whatever we've got in our bag, really. got, yeah. Uh, camera gear, photography gear. Yeah, we can we can, implement, we can implement some photography gear. <laughs> right. Yeah, right, cool. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna filter this water bushcraft style. Right, so what have we got? What have we got? What do we need? So I've just pulled out this uh, empty bottle, which I drank on the way here. Just a, a plastic bottle. Yeah. Normally be recycled, but we can actually recycle it in a slightly different way, yeah. and we can turn that into a water filter. Cool. I like that we're reusing plastic. Definitely good. Uh, right. Okay. What else do we need? Uh, so we're going to need to collect some natural materials in order to filter that water in different grades of sizes as well. So I think we're going to need some moss. Moss is always very good at capturing and absorbing you know, particles and things like that. So moss, some small stones, some very fine stones, and then some larger stones as well. Perhaps if we can get a bit of sand, that would be good as well. Okay, cool. Right, let's do it. Mike starts by cutting off the top of his plastic bottle and removing the lid. He then places the top of the bottle inside the base and asks me for some spare material. A lens cleaning cloth is perfect. Using a long blade of grass, Mike ties the lens cloth to the bottle, ensuring it can securely hold the weight of all of the materials and water that will be inside the filter. We add a mixture of fine gravel and larger stones, and top it off with a small amount of moss. filter is now ready for use. To demonstrate how effective the bushcraft filter is, we fill a bottle with extra dirty water. Look at the difference as it's passed through the natural materials. We repeat this process three times and now we have clean water ready to boil and make tea. So I have some uh, freshly filtered DIY bushcraft filtered water um, and yeah that's great it's nice and we're gonna boil it um, but I assume we're not just having 
hot water for tea. No, no, we're going to have some uh, stingy nettle tea. Nettle tea? Nettle tea. Nettle yeah. tea. Yeah. Oh, this, vid this video gets better and better. Right, let's go get some nettles. So we have another of edible plants here actually. We've got bramble here, which fruits like this, the old blackberries, but we're not gonna go for those in the tea, obviously, they're just, we can nibble on those. But this is a stinging nettle here. It's your standard kind of stinging nettle. Obviously it stings, but what you can do is blanch the leaves. Normally I'd pick this off near the stem and then just hold it over a flame, a fire, campfire, something like that. And the, the leaves will just blanch and it, they lose their sting. You, el you eliminate the, uh, the sting. But what I've got here is a lighter, so I can just hold this under a leaf, if the wind will allow, and just heat it, just to get rid of that sting. I don't want to burn it, I'm just essentially burning all those, getting rid of those hypodermic needles that, ha that are on this. Like that, that's blanched already, you can see it's gone a bit limp. So now I can pick it, and that's safe enough for, for a nettle tea. Mm. in it though that's what you want those those vitamins it's packed with it. nice. mm. so guys i hope you've enjoyed this video please take it with a pinch of salt it was just a bit of fun i wanted to do um with mike so yeah we've managed to do shelter tripod make some tea find north uh, what else did we do uh, paracord zips paracord zips yeah uh, just a bit of a different video, a bit of a fun video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, you need to check out Mike's channel, TA Outdoors. Yeah, and um, I'm going to give my own calendar a plug. It's now available for pre-order. All pre-orders will be signed, um, and those pre-orders will be ending soon. So I'll, I'll stick a link uh, here on screen where you can check those out if you want. So, yeah, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, bye for now. <laughs>